There are three major approaches that we take and I think are the most effective ways to understand developmental mechanisms of evolutionary change. The first one is understanding the morphology of uh, the, the nature of morphological change. So first we would like to understand exactly what happened. The second major approach that um, should be taken, uh, can be taken, is comparative embryology. So comparing, uh, looking, looking at uh, embryos, looking at um, those very structures uh, which changed morphologically during evolution, and see how they built differently in key species. The first approach should give you some idea about what the primitive condition was, the starting condition was, and what the derived condition, the ending condition was. And if you choose your species correctly, that is, if you have both basal and advanced conditions in the picture, by looking at the embryos, you should be able to understand what molecular changes took place, which correlate with those morphological changes which you discovered in your, uh, in, in, uh, in your, during your first approach. And then finally, the third uh, approach is to, to do a functional experiment when you try to link the molecular change and the morphological change can show that indeed the molecular change, the candidate uh, developmental change that you identified indeed causes the morphological change. So the first approach, the first step in uh, what I would consider a comprehensive EVO-DIVO study, EVO-DIVO analysis, is um, analysis of morphology. And here um, you can apply a variety of methods from very simple linear measurements. For example, measuring the length of the beak or the length of the wing or the color of the feather simple measurements, and uh, then you can uh, add more complicated measurements, for example, two-dimensional morphometrics, when you take an object into dimensions and you play landmark, pl place landmarks on it, and then you ask the computer to trace those landmarks and show you how, from one animal or plant to another one, how those landmarks change. So a lot of these um, subtleties often escape a human eye because the human brain is uh, designed so that if you look at, at more than three things and more than three things are changing um, in those objects, then your brain begins to lose the, uh, the logic of the change and it becomes basically more blurry. A computer doesn't suffer from this, so you, you can actually place hundreds of landmarks, um, these dots which indicate positions of important, um, uh, um, p p important landmarks, important objects on, for example, on the skull of an animal. And uh, the computer can then look at um, many um, species with, with landmarks on them and uh, can show you in a very graphic form how uh, over time this structure, for example, a skull, changes uh, with all the minute detail. And then you can apply mathematical analysis called uh, principal component analysis, which tell you which dimensions change and which direction. Um, again, very qualitatively with statistics involved, with specific measurements. So you can then know exactly what changed uh, and, and which direction. So and finally, lately we're now using three-dimensional morphometrics where we take, for example, in our work we focus on uh, morphology of uh, an evolution of skulls of vertebrates, so very complex three-dimensional structures. So now we use um, CT computer tomography scanning uh, using uh, high-density uh, x-rays to produce a very accurate uh, three-dimensional image of a skull which includes both um, external and internal, down to the bone structure, uh, features of that skull, all the features um, to the detail with some 20 or 10 micron resolution. So you get this very, very accurate copy of a, a digital copy of an object. And then you can place three-dimensional landmarks and you can use a computer to tell you how a skull of one animal um, changed into a skull of another animal um, in three dimensions. So these are the um, approaches one can take to understand the morphology, again, you can use very simple measurements, sim simple linear measurements, and the characteristics all the way to two-dimensional, three-dimensional um, quantitative uh, analysis with mathematical um, uh, statistical um, approaches as well. One important uh, consideration here is that you have to use, to interpret these morphological changes, you have to use a phylogeny, a molecular phylogeny, that is um, a tree, a genealogical tree, which is based on molecules rather than morphology. So a lot of earlier studies suffered from the fact that they used um, morphology-based trees, that is, they used morphology to understand how animals are related to each other, and that actually generates a very circular logic when you try to interpret uh, 
change of morphology by using morphology-based trees. And we know now how um, important um, events such as convergence, uh, a lot of animals and plants actually evolved very similar features, sometimes identical features in convergence, that is, they evolved them independently um, in because of the same or very similar selective pressures. So we prefer using molecular trees, trees which are based on molecular information, on sequences of DNA, mitochondrial DNA, for example, ribosomal RNAs, and others, uh, which have independent molecular clocks. So this molecular tree shows you a true relationship between species that you study, and then you use morphological information, you can throw it in this molecular tree, and that gives you a much more accurate understanding of which morphological changes occurred uh, in which direction. So that, so again, molecular tree combined with your morphometric analysis should, should tell you uh, what was the primitive condition, uh, what before the change and after the change, and uh, what changed exactly, for example, in the skull, which bones changed shape and size, and in which direction. So that gives you a very nice foundation for that um, kind of for a good Evodiva story. The second approach is uh, comparative developmental analysis or comparative embryological analysis, where uh, the early approach should again give you an idea which species would be key to understand that morphological transition. So which species you can use to represent a basal condition, a primitive condition, and which species you can use to represent uh, the after the change condition, the advanced um, altered condition. And what you want to do next is b most of these features that we study are actually built during development, during embryogenesis. Embryos build their skulls differently. And uh, if you compare developmental strategies for primitive and advanced species, you can very often see um, interesting molecular changes, which, are, uh, which you can um, then associate. Some of them correlate really well with the kind of morphological changes that you identified earlier. For example, a molecule expression pattern changes, its level of expression changes, um, something develop shifts developmentally that again correlates with, in terms of time and place, with the morphological change you're trying to explain. So that gives you a set of candidate genes and uh, pathways that um, uh, are associated with morphological change. That's the result of the second approach. And lastly, finally, uh, what you want to do next is what every geneticist wants to do, and that is do functional experiment, alter the developmental uh, pathways of genes, those candidate genes, and um, see whether the resulting phenotypes can prove that that molecular change that you just identified actually produced the morphological change that you wanted to explain in the first place. So um, an expression molecule, for example, an expression of a molecule changed, uh, the level of expression changed, for example, and you can actually often mimic such change using modern techniques. So the techniques which we're using, uh, this could be uh, sometimes simple applications of uh, molecules, so, so something you can buy. Uh, if the molecule change expression, for example, it's now it's expressed at much higher levels. You can obtain this molecule from a pharmaceutical company. You can make a virus which encodes this particular gene and uh, use this virus to force expression of this gene in a particular tissue. And if you mimic and the prediction is that if you mimic that molecular change very accurately in your laboratory model system, so usually these experiments are done in species which we can raise in the lab, such as chicken embryos. We can obtain a lot of chicken embryos from a farm, and you can manipulate them genetically. And, um, or mouse embryos, we can actually do uh, transgenic, we can produce transgenic mice, we can uh, alter gene expression, we can knock down, uh, turn off or turn on particular genes, developmental genes in the developing mouse embryos. So we can, again, ask a question whether the molecular change, whether this particular gene or pathway, which we identified as really is uh, important for that um, evolutionary change, is actually indeed genetically relevant. So we can manipulate that pathway or gene in a model system, in the chicken embryo or a mouse embryo or a zebrafish embryo, and look at the resulting phenotype. And if your prediction was correct, if you found indeed the, uh, the important molecule, then the resulting phenotype should match the predicted one. And then if that happens, uh, then you manage to close the circle and explain uh, the morphological change via particular molecular change. So that's those three approaches, you get morphologic analysis of morphology, um, finding candidate pathways using comparative embryology, and finally linking the two, linking the molecular, and morphological changes will give you a complete story of what actually happened during evolution of that animal or plant. Some of the major problems are related to both using what we call model 
species and uh, non-model species. Um, non-model species are species of animals or plants which we do not and sometimes cannot keep in the lab. They're too large, they develop too slowly, they're too rare, and so forth. Often they represent interesting evolutionary stories, but they're just not practical to keep in the laboratory. So we have to use model systems, our laboratory animals, such as, again, mice or chickens or zebrafish, which are cheap and uh, one can raise them in the lab, get their embryos on a regular basis, and manipulate them. So combining these approaches is a real challenge because um, not all the model systems which we have are quite applicable, quite useful for understanding of the non-model systems. A good e an easy example is that if you're curious about evolution in lizards, and we have a project where we are uh, studying um, lizards from a particular genus called Anolis. It's a fantastic example of a particular evolutionary process called convergence. A lot of these lizards in the Caribbean islands evolved very similar morphologies on different islands um, independently. That is, the same type of lizards evolved multiple times on multiple islands because they f were facing similar selective pressures, similar environments. Now, understanding this process developmentally is hard because we happen to have no good reptilian model systems. There are no uh, reptiles which we can breed easily in the lab. There are no reptilian mice, essentially. So we have mice again, we have zebrafish, we have chickens. Those represent birds, mammals, and fishes pretty well, but none of them are really good to understand evolution in reptiles and lizards. So. Uh, those are some of the challenges, again, uh, tr either trying to adapt non-model systems, wild species, um, to laboratory use, or, uh, again, uh, using ex existing model systems um, to explain this real, kind of real life um, stories that exist out there, but just happen to be non-practical for laboratory studies. For our field, I would expect that there will be some important breakthroughs that would allow us to understand um, some very important transitions, especially on macro level. So there are now really good examples of small-scale cha evolution changes to be explained using um, looking at particular genes or particular pathways. So I would expect that more of the large-scale evolutionary stories will become available and we will study them. They're more challenging, but they also are um, more uh, exciting in the sense that in the view of the public, microevolution, what's happening in the, between the species, is often separated from what's happening on macro level. And being able to show otherwise, being able to show again, specific mechanisms for macroevolutionary stories, I think would be very powerful too. <laughs>